Our society today is rapidly redefining everything. Have you noticed that? They're redefining everything. Even rewriting, redefining history, life, identity, gender, health. They're redefining everything, even redefining truth in general to the point where uh, really it seems like the uh, society as a whole is based on feelings. So if you feel your truth is your truth, well then great, I feel great that you feel great, that your truth feels good to you, but this is my truth, it feels different to me. And it seems like biblical truth has just been rejected or even redefined, the Bible being redefined. As a Christian, what is the faith-filled, courageous thing to do these days? Is there an objective truth worth standing up for? Does it do any good to stand up for what God defines as truth? What is your place as a Christian? What is your role? What is your calling? Do you speak up for truth and make everyone mad? Do you go around telling unbelievers how to live? Or do you go around telling everyone, you should live like I do? Is that our place? Is that what we're called to do? Or do you keep your head down, keep your mouth shut, and just hope someone quietly asks you about your faith? Is it possible for a Christian to stand up for truth today without being a jerk? Is it possible? Especially on social media. Can Christianity even survive in a world where it seems like a tsunami of liberal culture opposes it? Would you turn your Bible to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7? Hebrews 11, 7. We're in a series of messages on Sunday mornings from the chapter in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 11. And it is a chapter about the heroes of the faith. Not all of them, but just some good representative examples of the heroes of the faith. These are people that God applauds. So we, we take notice, like, wow, let's be inspired by their courage. Let's be challenged by their example and the things that they stepped out in faith to do. Today, we're going to focus on Noah. And his, his story in, in this part of the Bible is really short. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. I'm just going to read the first half of the verse right now. It was by faith. Someone say, by faith. By faith. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God, who warned him about things that had never happened before. I've asked some people to come and help me introduce this story. So come up on on stage now, and uh, come and help me, Pastor Christian, if you would. And uh, I'm just going to transform before your very eyes. Awesome, thank you. It's a one-size-fits-all, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's good. My name is Noah, and uh, my wife has come, and uh, my sons and their wives. i got Shem and Japheth and Ham <laughs> and their wives. Go ahead. And uh, just like happens uh, every time our family gathers, my wife is serving food. She loves to create food, loves, loves to serve food. In fact, is there any Johnny spice on that? <laughs> <laughs> it's the spice that goes in everything. Um, I, I have to, to confess something that's a little awkward, but I'm kind of a late bloomer. Uh, I was 500 years old before I started having kids. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the shy, the shy, you know, hardworking type. So, you know, it took me a while to get, get the thing going, but I'm going now. Got three sons. They're three beautiful wives. <sighs> but. What's the matter, dear? I know when something's on your mind. Tough day at work again? Yeah, Dad, you're not your normal chipper self. <laughs> well, I don't really know how to say this, 
But I talked with the Lord today. Really? How do you know it was God? What does he look like? Hold on. Let Dad explain what he means. Yeah, it's, it's not easy to explain. But when I met this stranger on the outskirts of the village today, there was something about him I just couldn't put my finger on. Though he looked younger than me, I sensed that he actually was older than me. Then he spoke to me, and when I heard his voice, I knew within my spirit it was the Lord. Come on, Dad. You've warned us to be skeptical about claims to hear the voice of God. Were you scared? I bet you were scared. Were you scared? You were scared. A little. (laughs) But his demeanor, his eyes signaled to me that I had nothing to fear. I was more frightened by what he had to say. What was it? I'm sure the Lord isn't one to mince words. Yeah, what was it? Are we going to move again? The Lord shared something about the future with me. Not surprisingly, he is saddened by the wickedness and violence everywhere in our world. He said his heart is broken. He is also angry. He plans to destroy all life as we know it with a catastrophic flood. But there is good news, too. God plans to save the human race through our family. And he plans to save animals uh, on the earth by constructing a huge ark, a gigantic boat, I gather, that will withstand the flood of water. The scary thing is that he's asked me to build it. Boat ride. This is awesome. Where we get the wood at. What do you think, Sham? How can the Lord ask this of you? Dad, you have no experience in construction at all. You can't even put a square peg in a square hole. (laughs) Well, that part is simple. God expects all of you to help me. Surprised look, scene ends. Let's give them some applause, shall we? Good job, everybody. Did you like the last part? No animals were harmed in making the, this motion picture. Uh, yeah, it'll come to you later. <laughs> Would you turn your Bibles, if you're, if you're probably already there uh, uh, in your mind, but in Genesis, the book of Genesis. And we're going to be uh, bouncing around a bunch of scriptures right there. We'll have them on the screen too, but it's always nice to have it in your hand. So Genesis chapter 6 is where the fuller story about Noah is. Chapter 6, verses 5 to 9. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. Now, don't just brush over that. What an assessment from God Almighty to look at the earth and say everything, everything they're thinking about and doing is consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them. Can you imagine God saying that about humanity? He was sorry he had ever made them and put them on the earth. The Bible says it broke his heart. And the Lord said, I will wipe, the human ra- wipe this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, and I will destroy every living thing. Jumping down to verse 8, but Noah. Somebody say, but Noah. But Noah found favor with the Lord. And skipping down a little further, Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time, and he walked in close fellowship with God. That's a phrase, the same phrase that was used about his great-grandfather, Enoch. And Enoch walked in close fellowship with God And he disappeared because God took him straight to heaven. Pretty amazing. Noah is in that company. Noah walked in close fellowship with God. 
And one day, God told Noah to build a boat, a large boat. And God, when God says to build stuff, he is very specific. He said, build it out of exactly this kind of wood. Build it out of exactly this mention, dimensions, this height, this width. In fact, this, this, this boat uh, has been recreated to God's dimensions. And, and you can actually go, and, and it's, it's a, a place you can just go and visit and get, get a feeling. The, the ark that God told him to build was five football fields long, was five stories high, and there were three decks inside. It was humongous. Genesis 6.18, God says, But I will confirm my covenant with you. He's talking to, to Noah. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. This is one of those times, it's who you know. Because all this good stuff was only said about one man, Noah. Not even about his family. But it was literally who you know and who you're connected with. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. So God went on to give more instructions. He said, take, take along food for, for, for your family. I don't think he told them this ahead of time, but they ended up staying on that boat for a year. A year before they actually walked out. The waters receded a little bit before that and stuff, but... They, they were camping, man. They were cruising on that ship for a long time. And God told them, take many pairs of animals. A lot of times, uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with the story, you might have heard two by two. And the thought is, oh, just one pair of each animal. Well, that's not what God said. He said, take seven pairs of animals, of all the clean animals, the, the animals that would be good for food or, or for sacrificing. And God, God said, take lots of those and take, take along pairs of animals to create more animals after the flood. Jumping down to verse 22. Now, all this is very strange. All this has never been done before. All of this does not make sense in the natural. But verse 22, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. That is courageous faith. <laughs> wow. Some authors estimate that it took Noah and his family 80 years to build that boat. So you might picture the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, where all the boats come up and they, they repair them and do all that kind of stuff. No, 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 no. This is in the middle of the plains and the desert of modern-day Iraq, nowhere near an ocean. This was not a boat-building port. This was God in the middle of nowhere just going, build me a boat, you're going to need it. And it needs to be exactly like this. What was Noah communicating to the world <laughs> While well, he's building his boat for 80 years, he's probably going and getting supplies, and people are seeing this thing take shape. It's so huge, you just couldn't miss it. So how was Noah, what was he saying? How was he communicating? Well, in 2 Peter, in the Bible, so this is written, a letter written by Jesus' apostle, Peter, in his second letter, chapter 2, verse 5, this is what he says, And God did not spare the ancient world, except for Noah and the seven others in his family. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. It's really interesting. There's quite a bit said about Noah in the Bible. So how did Noah warn the world? Well, first of all, with his actions. I mean, he was building the ark and I, I don't know if you get this, but the ark was a huge conversation starter. <laughs> like, you can't miss it. Like, what's that? What are you building there? <laughs> or, what you building there, governor? Like, however they would say it in their accent of that, of that place. I don't know exactly. But by his actions, by what he was doing, he was warning the world. But also, I believe, by his words. And the Bible doesn't say this specifically, but I believe that Noah was saying to anyone who would listen, you should help me and get in this boat. You should get in here too, because judgment is coming. There's a flood coming. What's a flood? And he tried to explain it the best he could. Uh, and I believe that with his actions and with his words, that he was, was telling people, you, you got the, your time is running out. You've got to get on the boat. 
Imagine what the godless people around them were saying as the ark started to take shape right there in the middle of the desert. What do you think you're doing? You're ignorant. You're old-fashioned. You're haters. You say that God told you to do this? Well, we don't need God. We've evolved. We don't need anyone telling us how to live. We don't need anyone telling us to build a boat. We don't need anyone telling us that rain's coming because we can figure it out on our own. That's what I picture they were saying. No reason. (laughs) Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. There had never been a, a flood. We don't know if there was rain, if rain had been happened or not, but there had never been the, um, just the, the fountains of the deep, the waters underground had never burst forth before. There had never been a flood like this. By his faith, Noah condemned the rest of the world, and he received the righteousness that comes by faith. So Noah walked in close fellowship with God, in stark contrast with the culture of his day. When God warned Noah about judgment to come, Noah responded in faith. And it's it's such a, a common story, even if you're not really that familiar with the Bible, you've probably heard about Noah. You probably know what the ark is. You probably know it involves some animals floating on a boat. Uh, maybe you learned all about it through the Steve Carell movie. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but you're probably sort of aware, and so it can be easy just to go, oh, nice, a nice little pretty picture. There's just little fluffy animals, little Pomeranians just <laughs> going around the deck of the boat. Oh, it's so cute, so sweet. But, like, this was... This was cataclysmic. This was catastrophic. This was also bad. It was huge. It was unprecedented. No one had ever seen anything like this before. But Noah responded in faith. Do you remember what faith is? Belief. Faith is, and he responded with belief that God would do what he said. Like he really took God at his word. Uh, and he also responded in, in trust. Trust that God would protect his family. A guy, uh, he, so he believes this flood's coming, and he, he's building a boat like, ah, oh, I hope this works. Uh, and he, so he, he trusted God, and he also had a commitment to obey, even though it seemed whacked. It seemed crazy. It, it doesn't make any sense to build a boat here. And what is rain? What is a flood? So what are you supposed to do as a Christian today? In today's godless, wicked world. In the Bible, I think I found a contradiction. So which way is right? 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23 is this section, but just just one verse, 22. Yes, Paul wrote, I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can to save someone. Okay, so there, there, there is um, a biblical uh, command, an example from the Apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders. He says, I try to find common ground with everybody. I want to well, fit in. I wanna, I'll go your way. He said, if I'm with weak people, I'm going to act weak. If I'm with Jewish people, I'm going to act Jewish. If I'm with non-Jewish people, I'm going to act non-Jewish just so I can save some. But... In 2 Corinthians 6, and I'm just going to focus on verse 17, but this whole section is good. He also writes, Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things. Can you see how those are opposite? So which one is right? They're both right. It was the same guy the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that wrote them both, both of those commands. So what are, what are you and I called to do as Christians? We're called to live in the tension. So this isn't going to be one of those sermons where I just wrap it all up for you and everyone just feels at peace and we just go out to lunch. You've got to live in a tension. There is a tension, a biblical tension, a God-ordained tension of fitting in, of building bridges, uh, and also of coming out from among them. So it's this tension between walking in close fellowship with Jesus 
and sharing the humanity of those around you while taking your friend's hands and putting it in the hand of your heavenly father. That's what we're called to do. you got to navigate the tension of building bridges to share the love of Jesus without joining in their sin. You're called, you probably heard this saying before, you're called to love the sinner and forgive the sin. Uh Uh-huh. Because that's what God does. Love the sinner and forgive the sin. That's your calling. Some of you are right, like, i got to write this down. I don't know about that. Good. And if I made you think, good. Go pray about it. Go read the Bible. That's, that's a great response to a message. Here's the truth. God judges sin. And it's nowhere more evident than in the story. Well, I mean, I guess it's, it's one of the biggest ones uh, of, of judgment in the story of Noah and the flood. I mean, God wiped out everybody on earth except for eight people. Wow. God judges sin. It's very clear. In Romans 6.23, it says the wages, the paycheck, the the payment for sin is, what is it? It's death. God says sin, that uh, when there is sin, that sin is going to be paid for with death. That is the penalty of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So people say, how could God judge anyone? Uh, when I was, I was uh, looking up some of the, uh, what, uh, the writings online about the ark encounter. That was the, that, um, that life-size reproduction of the ark. It's interesting to see how, like, one of the headlines was something like, wow, millions of people are excited about God's wrath. It was like, you know, like, they, like how could you be excited about this? Because he built an ark. <laughs> God says very clearly, the wages of sin is death, but God does not want anyone to perish, not one person. That is not God's will, but he has set up some things in motion. Sin leads to death, period. That is his universe. That is what he said. So when the first people chose to sin, God said, okay, that leads to death. And he even warned them ahead of time, don't sin, because that leads to death. The devil said, Just try it anyway. I bet you won't die. Guess what? They died. They died spiritually immediately. And then eventually their bodies died. Sin leads to death, period. And we are all sinners. Myself, you, me, we are all born into sin. So we all deserve to die. In God's system where sin leads to death, all of us are sinners. So you and I, we deserve death. But... Just like God saved everyone who was in covenant relationship with Noah. That's why I said I'm going to come back to that. God said Noah's righteous, and I'm going to save everyone that's connected to him, his family. It matters who you're connected to. So just like God saved everyone who was in in covenant relationship with Noah, today God saves everyone who enters into covenant relationship with Jesus. It's who you know. It's who you know. So if you know Jesus, you are saved from sin and saved from death. So there's no sense complaining or saying God is bad, God is judgmental, God is wrathful, because God is saying, why are you focusing on that when I gave my one and only son so you could live? That's what we want to focus on. God God, uh, said, this is the punishment, and he said, I'll pay it. I'll I'll take that punishment. So Jesus is the better Noah. Jesus is the fulfillment of Noah. All the things that Noah represents, that of of saving people and building a way to be rescued from destruction, Jesus is that times infinity. He is the ultimate Noah. And just like God used the ark, that boat, to rescue Noah's family from the flood. Jesus died in your place. Jesus died in my place to save us from eternal death and from separation from God and from hell. 
First Peter, you know who Peter is now, chapter 3, verses 19 to 20, says something very startling and very interesting. It, 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 in fact, it, it sounds like Jesus circled back to offer a second chance to all who were wiped out by the flood. Listen to this, 1 Peter 3.19. So he, Jesus, went and preached to the spirits in prison, those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently while Noah was building his boat. So God brought judgment on all that sin. Everybody was wiped out except Noah and his family. And I, I don't know how this worked, but I know the Bible says Jesus went back and he said, okay, I have made a way for you to be saved. I, I don't know how he did it, but right here in the Bible it says he went back and he, he preached to those who were shut out of the ark and wiped out. And he gave them, I believe, another chance. Jesus is the ultimate ark. So th that boat is so cool and all it represents is so amazing. Jesus is that. And uh, you guys, the whole Bible points to Jesus from the very beginning. In, in the first verse, uh, in the first verses of the Bible, we see Jesus uh, uh, hinted at. And all through the Bible, we see uh, how Jesus is the remedy. He is the payment for our sin. All through the Bible, there, we call it the scarlet thread of redemption. All through the Bible, you see God had a plan, even though he knew that if he gave us free, free will, we might choose to sin, and we did. God said, I'm, I'm going to make a plan because I don't want anyone to perish or be lost. So my question is, will you be a Noah to this generation? Will you walk in close fellowship with God? Will you hear God's heart and his voice so that you can do his will and obey? Will you let your faith be seen in attractive ways? Will you warn people that sin leads to death and that there is a penalty to pay? But will you also share that if you put your faith in Jesus, the free gift of God is eternal life. Amen. Will you share that? Something little but very significant happened to me a couple of weeks ago. And it's, I, I know it's sort of silly, but it, it just meant so much to me. I just want to share it, something God did for me. The, the way my, uh, my rhythm works is uh, I always mow the lawn on Fridays. Fridays, we're out of the office. And uh, I, I look at the weather and see, is it, gonna, is it gonna rain or not? If it's raining, then I don't really wanna do it. So then I'll wait till Saturday. And there's been several times lately that I haven't been able to mow my lawn for two weeks. So then it's twice as hard, you know, cause it's twice as long. It's many more emptying into the, into the thing. And uh, on, on, the, on this certain day, I, I had planned, oh, I, I, I'm not going to mow the lawn today. Uh, I, I always, I, I know this is TMI, I always mow the lawn and then shower. If I'm going to mow the lawn, it's first thing, then I shower. Because uh, I don't like the smell of the exhaust of it. And so I had already showered. I was like, okay, I see on my phone it's raining all day. Okay, this isn't a lawn mowing day then. Okay. But in the middle of the day, I look out, hey, it's, it's sunny. Wow, this is my opportunity. So I, I get into my lawn mowing clothes, I go outside, and all of a sudden, it starts misting. And then the drops start getting bigger. And I just paused, and I just said, Lord, would you do this for me? I, if you don't, I won't be mad. Because I know there's a lot of bigger answers you got to give out there. But would you just make it not rain for me? And part of the reason was because we prayed for no rain for a few events, and God gave it to us. He changed the weather forecast. I said, God, would you do this for me? Would you make it not rain while I mow? It stopped immediately. I mowed the entire thing on the last 
strip of mowing, it started to rain. That is an answer to prayer. That's not a coincidence in my book. God did that. And I share that because to me, to me, what that meant was that God sees me and he answers prayer. And I have taken the faith that I gained from that and now I'm praying about some bigger stuff. Like if God can do that, he can do this other thing too. I believe it. Would you stand to your feet? And let's pray. Before we pray, you can keep rising for a minute. I just want to ask, will you be a Noah to this generation? Okay, bow your heads. Let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you so much for the ark. What a cool illustration of salvation and rescue and deliverance. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the ark, but thank you, Jesus, that you are our ark. Lord, thank you for the example in Noah that, wow, what he must have stood up to, the abuse he must have gotten, the mocking, the ridicule he must have faced, and yet he stayed steadfast for, it could be 80 years. Lord, we want to be like that. I want to be like that. I want to have that kind of faith where I believe, I trust you, and I commit to obey you, even if it doesn't make sense to me. Lord, I want that kind of faith. With your head still bowed, I want to ask you, will you be a Noah to this generation? Will you? If so, would you raise your hand? And you're just saying to God, God, I will be a Noah. You, uh, I'm yours. You got me. What, what, what you need, I'm there. I'll share. I'll walk in close fellowship with you. I'll use my words. I'll use my actions to point to you, Lord. And I'll get as many people on the ark of salvation as I can. Lord, you see our hands raised. We, we want to be a Noah in this generation. You need some Noahs now. And Lord, we're saying we're in. We're in. And so, Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would come and empower this momentary decision with the ability to live it out. Lord, I pray that we'd start by just walking in close fellowship with you, that we'd hear your voice, that we'd know what you're asking, that we'd do it, that we'd respond, we'd say, yes, I'll do it. And Lord, if you've got to start us small and work us big, we're, we're up for it. Take us through the school of the Spirit. Amen. And Lord God, help us not to shrink back when you give us an opportunity. Thank you, Lord. Help me be a Noah today. Help us be a Noah today. In Jesus' name. You can put your heads down, but I want to ask you one more thing. Would you just keep your heads bowed for just one more minute? And online, I hope you're just praying too. I want to give you an invitation to put your faith in Jesus, to actually become his apprentice. An apprentice studies a master, studies a journeyman, sees how it's done, begins to emulate, begins to do those same things, and carry on the work of the journeyman. Will you be an apprentice of Jesus? How do you do that? Turn away from your sin. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead you. Let him call the shots in your life. Maybe you've kind of wandered away from your faith. Maybe you've kind of wandered away from God. And today you want to say, oh, yeah, I'm coming back. I'm going to put my faith in Jesus for salvation. It's like putting your faith in the ark. Only Jesus is the better ark. Or maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus before. And today's your day. I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. And if that's you today, I want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand also? No one's looking around right now. Uh, people are, uh, who are already Christians are praying. And if today's your day to put your faith in Jesus, would you just raise your hand to God? And by that, you're saying, God, put my faith in Jesus today. I want to be saved. I want to be forgiven. That's awesome. I see you, man. That's good. That's good. How about online? Would you raise your hand to God too? Whether you're watching live or watching later, that's okay. You can still put your faith in Jesus. I'd love to just coach you in a prayer. Would you just repeat after me? And if you're, if you're putting your faith in Jesus today, pray this from your heart to Jesus. Here we go. Jesus, Jesus. I, invite I invite you into my life. Into my life. I, acknowledge I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. 
Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and be your apprentice. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you did that today, praise God. It might seem sort of simple to you uh, because it was just a quick prayer. That's because Jesus did the hard work. He gave his life on the cross for you. He loves you. He poured it out for you. And so you responding is the beginning of, of a walk with him. And I want to encourage you to, to take the Connect card. Hopefully you fill, filled out one earlier. But if not, just fill it out really quick. And at the bottom, check one of those boxes that tells me, yes, I put my faith in Jesus today. I, I really want to know that. And I, I have a little addendum. So you can stay here and, and uh, just kind of back me up. All right, be my wingman. Okay, yeah. awesome. <laughs> After the floodwaters receded, one of the first things, well, the first thing that we know that Noah did was he built an altar and worshiped the Lord. So imagine saving these animals for a year and he sacrificed them, uh, you know, however many, to the Lord as an act of worship. And God saw that and he was just so pleased with Noah's faith and that they had, had taken him up uh, on this, building the boat and surviving and all that stuff. God said, I'm going to make a covenant with you, Noah. And this is one of the major covenants of the Bible, the Noahic, the, the Noah and God covenant. And God said, I'm going to never again destroy the whole earth with a flood. <laughs> Not with a flood. <laughs> um, Genesis 9, 13, God said, I have placed my, do you know what? Rainbow. Whose rainbow? Interesting. I have placed my rainbow in the clouds. And I believe that they probably had never seen a rainbow before because it had not been raining. And so that's, it's the rainbow that, that the sunlight through the, the drops that makes a rainbow. And God said, it is the sign of my covenant with you and with all the earth. And I, I just want to encourage you, every time you see a rainbow, think of God and salvation and the ark and God's covenant with humanity and how much God loves you. So rainbows are not just pretty. And they're not just something that we take and we make it say whatever we want. A rainbow is a sign that God saves. That's what a rainbow is. And it is God's rainbow. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks, Pastor Garen. And I love how you said how we're called to, God is calling us to live in the tension of loving others and like living among them, being a part of the community and loving the people around us, but also separating ourselves from the world, separating ourselves from the sins of the world. And both of those, though they seem like they contradict, they don't. So many things that God has told us are like that because he wants us to be the best. And sometimes we don't even understand like how all these things work together, but it all works together to love God and love people. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, if you filled out that Connect card, the ushers are going to be coming down the line. Um, just pass it into them, and then we'll be reading them this week. And then um, if you could, we just need probably five or six people after service to help set this place up for Together Nights. Reminder, Together Nights is tonight at 6 p.m. We have kids, adults, and youth, and nursery. Something for everyone. It's a great time. All right. We love you all. God bless. <laughs>